Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, UNL Extension meat specialist Dennis Burson talks to us about the recent controversy surrounding lean, finely textured beef. We'll take a look at spring wheat emergence with Lowell Sandell. Drew Lyon updates us on winter wheat conditions. And Ron Pavelka from the Nebraska Soybean Board discusses his recent trip to South Korea and China. But first, on Friday morning, the USDA released reports on quarterly grain stocks and planting intentions. We talked with North Dakota State Extension economist Frain Olson after the releases about what those numbers mean for corn and soybean markets. This morning, USDA released two reports that had an effect on corn and soybean and wheat markets, pr prospective plantings and grain stocks. And Frayne Olson is our guest. Let's talk about some of the surprises here. Let's look at the numbers. And corn in terms of acres planted is the one that everyone was looking at. And it's a bit on the high end at 95.9 million acres, up 4% from last year. That means soybeans comes in just under 74 million and spring wheat acres are down 3%. So those numbers alone, before we get to the good part, for corn at least, those numbers alone surprising to you? Uh, yes, they were a bit surprising. And, I, and the corn number, you know, everybody's expecting a pretty big corn number. Most of the week, we had seen some softening of the of corn prices with the expectation we're going to get close to the 95 number. And of course, the number we had this morning was actually outside of the trade range, which is, again, a bit negative for, for the, the new crop pricing. So that was the biggest surprise. Um, again, on the soybean side, we were expecting a little bit lower on soybeans. Again, this, uh, this number came out to be below the trade expectations. So not only were we we're looking at the, at the numbers, we're, the trends we were looking for, but the trend was much, much wider than we had expected. So those numbers for soybeans helped. What helped corn was stocks, and they're down 8% from the last measurement a year ago. Uh, that's a big boon for corn, and does that help to ensure that the acres estimate is going to hold out? Um, in, in one respect, yes, and in another respect, no. So let's talk about what the trade was expecting versus the numbers we got. The, the stocks report came out for all of the major commodities, corn, soybeans, and wheat, came out very close to what the trade was expecting. Now the difference is the trade was a bit more aggressive in, in usage for, for all the major commodities than the last USDA estimates uh, out of the WASDE report, supply-demand estimates. So the trade was expecting a little bit more aggressive use and basically their numbers were confirmed, which should be supportive, especially for old crop prices. And I guess one of the things as we move forward, we need to be thinking a little bit about the separation between old crop and new crop pricing. Right. One of the things that we talked about before we went on the air is, is the way that these numbers are calculated. And it seems that no matter when the, the reports come out, there is a little hostility towards the USDA. Now, in this report, in these two reports, there's something good for everyone. But what's the thing to keep in mind when we talk about prospective plantings and grain stocks? The, and that's a very important point, that these are survey-based reports. When we talk about the WASDE or the supply-demand estimates, those are forecasts that are put together by the Economic Research Service, which is one division within USDA. The reports we had to get today were out of uh, NAS, or National Ag Statistics Service, which is a little bit different branch, and it's survey-based information. So what they're doing is, is surveying farmers, they're surveying industry, and they're reporting the numbers that are they're actually come back in those surveys. So, you know, we've got to be a bit careful. I know USDA takes a lot of shots over time, but this is one where, the, you know, farmers themselves are the ones that are reporting this, and they're summarizing the information for us. 
NASA says the corn and soybean acres total will be the largest in history. Corn alone would be the largest since 1937 before World War II if it lives up to 95.9. Is this something that holds out for the next five years in terms of how many acres are going in the ground? You know, that's, that's really the wild card as, as we move forward in time. Because if you think about trend line yields and the fact that every year we tend to get a little bit better uh, yields per acre, the question is, do we really need all of these acres as we move forward in time? In, in this case, in today's conditions, we do need those acres because our stocks are so tight. The question again as we move forward, if we have a really big corn year this year, we will have the capacity to not only meet demand, but also to rebuild some of our stock base which means then moving into 2013, we don't have to have these, these big 94, 95 million acre numbers for corn. What are you gonna see here in the next few weeks in terms of marketings? Is it something where everyone rushes to it or you sit tight and wait for a month or two? Well, that's gonna be the wild card. You know, the first number we needed for a, you know, plantings or, or estimates of total production is the planted report. And the question the, as we move forward in time is what adjustments are gonna take place? Has the information we got today and, and shifting in relative price is going to pull some of those corn acres back into soybeans or not. I suspect we will. My, my recommendation, my suggestion to, to farmers is if you're looking at trying to price some new crop soybeans, I think we're going to have some opportunities right now. If we're looking at new crop corn, uh, we're going to have to watch the weather very, very closely because we still have to have the yields and the yield potential as we move forward. So I think there will be some opportunities as we move into the weather and the season, uh, the, plant, the growing season this year to, to pick up some higher corn prices. The USDA also released its quarterly report on hogs and pigs. And next week, we'll take a look, closer look at those numbers with the University of Missouri Extension Ag Economist Ron Plain. In late January, McDonald's, Burger King, and Taco Bell announced they would stop using a meat product dubbed pink slime in their beef. A month later, in what ABC News labeled a startling investigation, a former USDA scientist said the lean, finely textured beef shouldn't be used. That scientist had coined the term pink slime in an earlier memo. Fast forward to this week, as Beef Products Incorporated, a producer of the meat, has shut down plants in Iowa, Kansas, and Texas. Its plant in South Sioux City remains open, and three governors and two lieutenant governors, including Nebraska's Rick Sheehy, toured that plant on Thursday to support the product and its workers. This week, we talked with Dennis Burson, a UNL Extension meat specialist, about why some consumers fear a product approved by the USDA. Within the beef industry, when we fabricate uh, uh, meat cuts or when we cut meat cuts, uh, steaks and roasts and, and such, uh, today the consumer wants very little fat on the, on the cut. And so what we end up with are some lean trimmings, and then those lean trims, many, many of them have a lot of fat in the content. Mm -hmm and uh, it becomes too expensive to try and knife all of that out and so uh, techniques have been developed to recover the lean portion and the protein portion of that material and that's what uh, lean finely textured beef is. It's, it's basically a system that recovers the lean. So plants that have received heat over the past week or two, how do they go through the process of putting this or getting it, getting the lean finely textured and get, then getting it to supermarkets where it's added into beef? Okay, they, they produce a uh, product that is added to other products. Uh, in the process of uh, ex extracting some of the fat, uh, they need to uh, finely texture the meat in order to extract the fat from it. And uh, in addition, uh, there's a, a high level of concern right now about foodborne illness, and they need to also think about controls for pathogens such as E. coli or salmonella that can make people sick. And so they will treat it with what we call an antimicrobial treatment. Uh, there are two basic types of treatments that are being used in the industry. Uh, the one that's received the most attention is ammonium hydroxide mm. treatment. Let's talk about the major fears. Uh, ABC News in their story said this is a product that was used in the past in dog food and cooking oil. So obviously the public had an outcry about that. What are the, what are the real risks to consumers? Well, first of all, uh, the product is produced as human food. Uh, it's not, uh, even though it, you know, you can take anything mm. and send it to right. pet foods or dog foods, but uh, the product is a, produced as a human food and that needs to be clear. It's produced under USDA FSIS inspection and it's produced as human food. Uh, what are the risks? Well, the, the, the companies that use the, uh, 
um, ammonium hydroxide need to prove to the uh, USDA, and USDA has to review and approve it, uh, that the process does not affect uh, the, the composition or does not present a hazard. And in fact, uh, this compound uh, it, with uh, FDA approval has been listed as a grass substance that's general, generally recognized as safe. And so both FDA and USDA have said that this is a safe process uh, from the information that they have seen from the company that supplied for it. What are the limitations in using it in beef, both regulatory and, you know, conceivably how much you can put in? The lean, finely textured uh, beef has a uh, use limitation of 15% uh, in a product. Uh, processors may not use that high of a level because uh, there could be some uh, quality issues that they would uh, be concerned with, and so uh, use levels are usually lower than that. Um, and so once they achieve their fat content in ground beef, uh, then that's, that will limit them probably to a lower use level. So in the end, it is safe for human consumption. There is a limited amount that's put in. That's correct. Uh, the uh, safety of the product uh, has been reviewed by uh, USDA and FDA. Uh, and as I would look at it, uh, if you try to think about the potential hazards that might be involved in our food system, I'm a, a person that does a lot of hazard analysis. Uh, the, the hazard or the risk of this compound is, is almost nil or very, very low, if anything. And uh, uh, the hazards, though, of E. coli 0157 and salmonella are not. Uh, they're more serious. Burson says if the USDA would be required to list lean, finely textured beef on labels, drawing the line on numerous other ingredients and processes would be incredibly difficult. With spring planting soon to start, this week we talked with UNL Extension weed science educator Lowell Sandell about controlling weeds after what's been an unusually warm winter and spring. It's been a very odd spring so far and we are uh, ahead of normal in a number of senses. Uh, winter annual weeds are already uh, blooming and actually fairly close to dropping seed uh, at this point in time. And, uh, controlling winter annual weeds is on producers' minds uh, right now. Especially with planting, some people are already out in the fields. I'm sure others are getting the planters ready. So how soon should they be controlling these winter annuals? Yeah, we've done some research in the last couple of years that would indicate uh, as long as we have winter annual weeds controlled um, a, about two weeks prior to planting, uh, they should not have any effect on uh, the corn and soybeans uh, that we're planting for, for this season. Is there a number that's greater than usual or is it, it just seems like it because it's so early? Well, it, yeah, it just seems like it because it's, it's so early uh, at this point. And because producers are, I, I think in many cases, kind of anxious to get out right. uh, in the field, um, you know, getting out and getting a solid uh, burn down program uh, that does a good job at c controlling the winter annual weeds uh, it should probably be a, a priority uh, in many cases ahead of planting at this at this time. So those are winter annuals. With summer annuals, how soon are those going to start to come back up? Yeah, yeah so again, it's a, it's a bit of a strange season so far. Uh, we do have uh, reports of a number of some early emerging summer annual weeds coming up, giant ragweed. Uh, we've observed lambs, quarters, and kochia, at least in the eastern mm -hmm. part of the state, uh, already emerging. And if producers are um, coming in, uh, say ahead of corn, uh, and planning to use a residual chemistry, uh, if the um, they should scout their fields, and if they already have summer annuals up and growing, uh, make sure that the burn down component of that uh, residual chemistry uh, is more than just glyphosate, uh, so that they have, uh, uh, are, so that they aren't imparting uh, glyphosate selection pressure alone on the burn down aspect of already emerged weeds. And what's the important thing to remember there when you talk about getting a, a clean field for the, the entire crop growing season or at least the, the most important parts? Yeah, when we talk about that, we talk about uh, the critical period of weed control and we encourage folks to, um, to basically uh, start the crop off uh, weed free and if they can maintain uh, uh, the crop weed free up through, and it depends on uh, fertility and some other management factors, but if they can maintain that crop weed, th weed free uh, through uh, B7 corn uh, approximately, they've done a really good job at maintaining their maximum yield potential, at least from a, a weed competition standpoint at, that way. 
Later in the show, we'll see what the weather might look like in the coming week for farmers getting ready to head to the field. If the Omaha School Board gives its approval, agricultural programs will return to the state's biggest school district for the first time in nearly 10 years. The Omaha World Herald says Omaha Bryan is set to start ag classes this fall with the board's agreement. A committee vote is expected the first week of April on a three-year grant for just over $288,000, with a full board vote expected after. We talked last week with Ron Pavelka from Glenville, the District 7 Director of the Nebraska Soybean Board. Pavelka recently traveled with the U.S. Meat Export Federation on a whirlwind tour in Asia. Well, it was a quick trip, but we were in Seoul, South Korea, Guangzhou, China, and Hong Kong. And the purpose of this trip is what? Well, it was for investing parties in USMEF. So there were pork producers, soybean producers, and corn growers associations from across the United States. And we were there to kind of check up on USMEF and, and see what kind of projects they're working on in that area. Give me the current state of, of how the USMEF is, is, is working with these countries to get products from this country to those. Well, I tell you, it, for a producer, you kind of think that uh, marketing just happens mm -hmm. and that product is selling itself, but that is far from the case. You, you go see what they're doing overseas and, and whether you're visiting a retailer or a wholesaler, you're realizing that there is a lot of effort that has to go into getting that product placed in a foreign country. USMEF is working with retailers, uh, wholesalers, grocery stores, a whole gamut, and they're placing that product. In, and you can see in some of the meat cases there were U.S. flags, but there were also Brazilian flags, uh, Australian flags. And if we're not there promoting our product, we're just going to be out of that meat case. The competition exists. Exactly. So what are their concerns? What do they want in their food that they're getting from this country? One of the big things that they were, were stressing was the, the old story of traceability, something that we haven't here in the United States totally embraced, but it is something that their market is desiring, and we're going to have to look closely at adopting some type of a system. It's different, though. The cultures are different, right? Is that something to adjust to? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we're used to going to the grocery store and, and buying our, our uh, groceries for the week or so, and, and their culture is more about buying what you need for that one right. day, maybe just one meal, and uh, going to those wet markets. And, and again, you know, they're, they're developing, especially in Korea, some more Americanized uh, systems where you're going to the grocery store and we were even a, in a Sam's Club, but uh, still tradition means a whole lot to everyone over there and typically it is going to those small markets and buying that one meal or one day's worth of food. Is Korea one of the markets that's sort of taking off over the last few months or could take off for the next year? Well, absolutely. And you know, while we were there, uh, the free trade agreement was actually first implemented. The first phase okay. was, was uh, being implemented. So they were very excited about that. and. Uh, as far as their culture, they're maybe a little more Americanized than, say, in China or Hong Kong. So they were having an appetite for a few of the higher dollar cuts. Not so much uh, as an everyday type of mm -hmm. an occurrence, you know, where I'd have a steak every so often, but theirs is maybe uh, for a birthday or a holiday okay. type of a deal. So, but we did have an excellent ribeye while we were there. There is a lot of cost in getting meat from here all the way to over there. What is, is there an issue of affordability once it gets to those markets? Uh, the, the transportation really wasn't as big of an issue as, according to them, as just the actual uh, trading price of the commodity right now, whether it be pork or beef or whatever. Uh, again, it was just kind of a cultural issue as far as being able to use a fresh product. And they, they're really averse to using a frozen product, which they, they're using more of that, but still culturally wise, they would rather use a fresh product. So if we can get a chilled product there within 10 to 12 days, that, that seems to fit into their system fairly well. And as we talk about agricultural exports, last week we saw how soybeans reached international markets in our trip to Washington. Also in our trip west, we toured Imperium Renewables. And next week we'll have more on one of the largest biodiesel production facilities in the country. Weed across the state is in much better shape than a year ago. The USDA rates 71% of the crop good to excellent. That's 31 percentage points above the same date a year ago. But UNL Extension Dryland Crop Specialist Drew Lyon says even though wheat is better, warm temperatures could have a negative effect on the crop. We had very poor stands as a result of a very dry fall. We have much better wheat stands this year than we did a year ago. 
we have a lot of growth on it. Actually, for right now, we've had very warm temperatures. The, the wheat is greening up and starting to really grow. Unfortunately, uh, we're a little dry and quite windy, and some of our smaller wheat, some of that wheat that was planted late, has suffered from some uh, blowing and erosion problems. The concern is that uh, crop development is driven by temperature and that the crop will develop quickly, and then it's not uncommon to have very cold temperatures in, in the first part of April, and so we'll get wheat moving a little too far along, and it'll be more susceptible to a, a real freeze happening uh, in that sometime in April. Lyons said farmers could use rain in the panhandle where precipitation totaled less than an inch in March. In the March Nebraska farmer, despite a generally positive state of ag economy, one group thinks not all is well for Nebraska agriculture. Mark Vickers, the president of an Omaha-based investment banking company, says Nebraska lags other neighboring states in attracting new livestock operations and in wind power development. Vickers and Jim Jenkins, a cattleman from Callaway, contend that state regulations and local zoning regulations restrict the state's economic development. You can read more about the Nebraska Agriculture and Livestock Foundation and its view that Nebraska is unfriendly for ag businesses wanting to invest in the March Nebraska farmer. And now, UNL Extension statewide climatologist Al Dutcher steps in to forecast the next seven days across the state. Well, folks, here we are again on Friday morning. Of course, this last week, we once again seen very warm conditions and considerable amount of wind, and that does have us concerned with the drying potential as we've seen a very dry air mass and very high fire indices. We're sucking some of that soil moisture that's remaining at the surface away, and we need to replenish it. We did see some scattered thunderstorm activity develop during the Wednesday night into the Tuesday time frame across portions of south central and southeast Nebraska, and then, of course, we've seen the cold front uh, try to work its way through the state during the last 24 hours. It did generate some severe weather and scattered thunderstorm activity across eastern Nebraska, but left much of western Nebraska high and dry. Now, as we go through this next seven-day period, we do have the opportunity for some precipitation, particularly as we get into the early part of next week and the possibility of some freezing temperatures moving into at least the panhandle as we get into the Tuesday time frame. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we have in stores and move through this next seven day period. And as we go to the upper air models, what we'll show you is that the trough that was responsible for some of the scattered thunderstorm activity has now moved in into the Ohio River Valley and weakening as it progresses eastward. And we're turning our attention to the Pacific Northwest where another trough is starting to move in and will rapidly move into the Central Plains as we move through this next seven day period and eventually move that energy out into the plains in the early part of the week. So for today, we're going to see temperatures primarily in the low 70s across the northeast to the upper 70s across the southwest, and we'll start to see a ridge building in as we go into tomorrow. And as we go into tomorrow, what we're going to see is the ridge starting to build back up. Southwest flow in the upper atmosphere is going to lead to some very warm temperatures as we're looking at highs and low 80s across the northeast to the upper 80s across the southwest. And it would not surprise me whatsoever that if we see some low 90s across portions of extreme southwestern Nebraska. Now, as we get into Sunday, we're going to notice that trough starts to dig in rather deeply into the western United States. And of course, we're going to see very warm conditions spreading out into at least the eastern half of Nebraska. We'll be looking at highs in the upper 80s across the southeast and possibly south central Nebraska. As we get up into the northwestern part of the state, we're saying low 80s, and that's dependent on how quickly this cold front at the surface moves through. If it moves through early in the day, we're going to drop temperatures at least 10 degrees from these highs. If it's a little slower, then we'll paint these highs. But we'll see an increase in thunderstorm activity as we go through the overnight hours. Now, depending on which model we run, uh, we look at either this low cutting off or we see a trough progressing across. And the model I'm using is indicating that the trough, this low will move out and then cut off from the main flow, and that will keep some of the cool air at bay. So we may be looking at highs in the mid-60s across the northwest to the low 80s across the southeast. Now, if this comes as one trough, we can drop about 10 to 15 degrees off of these highs, and we will see an increase in thunderstorm activity. But right now, with this model, we keep the heaviest of the precipitation to the south of us. By the time we get to Tuesday, we'll see this upper air low progressing eastward, and we'll be looking at temperatures that will be in the upper 50s across the north to the mid-60s across the south, and we probably will see freezing temperatures with a hard freeze possible across the panhandle as we get into Tuesday morning. Now, by the time we get to Wednesday, we'll see that this system moves well to our east. Ridging starts to replace the trough, and we'll see highs start to move back up, mid-60s east to low 70s west. And as we get into Thursday, we'll start to see that ridge redeveloping. We'll look at highs in the low 70s in the east to the upper 70s across the west. The 8 to 14 day forecast indicates warm air moving into our region. And as we get into the precipitation forecast, we'll notice a drier trend moving in from the southwest into the central plains. Thanks, Al. In early March, Apple's iTunes store surpassed 25 billion mobile app downloads. With mobile device usage on the rise, users have several informational sources at their fingertips. As we close out this week, Curtis Harms reports on a new tool from Market Journal. 
Mobile phone and tablet usage is on the rise, and Market Journal is ready to provide these users with the latest agricultural information. The Market Journal mobile app is now available for iPads and smartphones, such as iPhones and Android devices. By using the app, users will have the option to view current and archive program segments with the touch of a finger. Two major shipping ports for goods moving to China. Japan, the end of day futures countries. prices are available each day to help crop and livestock producers with their marketing plans. Users can even select their local grain elevators in the state to identify current prices. Underneath the news tab, several up to the minute ag stories are available from Market Journal, the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and UNL's Crop Watch. The mobile app will identify the location of users' devices using GPS technologies to provide local weather conditions. Within the mobile app, users can learn more about the Market Journal show and learn about the program team and regular guests. The iPhone and Android versions of the app allow users to submit their agricultural photos and ask questions of the program's experts, which may be addressed on future programs. For Apple devices such as iPhones and iPads, the free app is available through iTunes. The Market Journal mobile app is also available through the Google Play mobile app store for Android devices. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Curtis Harms. In addition to the new Market Journal app, you can also find more information about agriculture or the program on our website, marketjournal.unl.edu, or through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Next week, Ron Plain is our marketing analyst. UNL Extension poultry specialist Sheila Purdom will show us a new cage system for poultry. And UNL Ag Economics professor Dennis Conley will look at rising fuel prices as gasoline and diesel both climbed for a ninth consecutive week. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.